Having looked at a basic introduction to systems thinking and also the conventions for causal loop diagramming, I want to take a different path now and look at what Peter Senge and others have called archetypes, systems archetypes. That is, we have, un we have now developed an understanding of causal loop diagrams, uh, how to take a holistic view of systems, how systems are really interconnections of positive and negative feedback loops or balancing and reinforcing feedback loops, and that understanding the behavior of the system really requires us to understand all of these interlocking loops and to identify which loops are affecting the system's behavior. And if at all we want to intervene in a system, it's good for us to understand which are those loops that are dominant within the system. So we've looked at those things. Now we want to turn our attention to systems archetypes, which really are recurring patterns of system structures. That is, although we can build several complex systems using causal loop diagrams, and although we might think that you know it's possible for systems of infinite complexity uh, to be around, and therefore one might even wonder, oh, this all looks really complex, how can I really apply it? The good news is that people have identified certain patterns of how systems are organized and how systems behave, and these patterns recur. So the idea is, well, if you understand these patterns, and of course, for every pattern, we might say this pattern occurs in this way, and if you want to intervene in the system, then it's a good idea for us to, uh, to apply the generic solution for a particular pattern, or the generic suggested intervention for a particular pattern. Then it makes it easy for us to look at very complicated systems, look for archetypes, and then say, well, you know, although uh, this is a new system, I'm looking at it for the first time, but I'm able to understand that a common archetype that I've encountered before is what I'm seeing here, and therefore I have developed a real bird's eye view of this system, and I understand the dynamics of the system, and I can ask intelligent questions about, about this system to understand it better, and probably even suggest ways by which we could approach changing the system. That's the idea here, and in this, in this part of the series, we'll be looking at system archetypes, okay, which are really generic, commonly recurring structures of systems. Take a look at this causal loop diagram example. So we've got a customer base for a particular company. And of course, the larger the customer base, the more the revenues the company is going to get. And therefore, the greater the revenue, the greater the more the company can spend on advertising. That makes the product even more attractive, which serves to increase the customer base. That's one side of the loop, the positive reinforcing feedback loop, which tends to keep on increasing your customer base. But then, of course, we have already seen that there could be another side of this loop, which says the greater your customer base, the more your challenge to maintain your service levels, right? So unless you do something, your service levels are going to start deteriorating, which decreases the attractiveness of your product, and that could serve to reduce your customer base, which is the balancing feedback loop, okay? So that's really what's happening. So in this particular example, we are seeing that the service level, the stress that is put on your service level as your customer base increases, automatically serves as a limiting factor to the uncontrolled growth of your customer base, which is potentially possible with the positive feedback loop or the reinforcing feedback loop, right? So your service capacity acts as a limiting factor on the growth of your customer base, okay? So this you will find in all cases when you've got a reinforcing feedback loop that looks like you can keep on growing forever, you'll always find that there are several other balancing loops that serve to limit the growth. So this is a common archetype, that whenever you've got positive feedback loop where something looks like it can grow on uh, infinitely, 
you'll find that there are several other limiting factors that serve to limit the growth. Okay, so whenever we encounter a positive feedback loop, obviously it makes sense for us to look at, well, there must be some limiting factors. Let me try and identify them. So here's an example again of a company which uh, here we are using slightly different notation uh, for a positive feedback loop. We are showing uh, a snowball gathering as it rolls down. For a negative feedback loop or a balancing loop, you're showing a seesaw that balances it. And uh, uh, we are not showing the the loop link polarities at all. Okay. So here, the company has several new products, let's say. Therefore, it increases revenue. It's able to afford even more for R&D. It can develop even more products. That's the positive feedback loop. But the corresponding balancing loop is as you develop new products, okay, uh, the, the loop goes like this. As you develop new products, you get more revenues, you get more R&D budget, but then the size of your engineering staff increases, which makes the management problem of managing R&D more complex, which tends to put management burden on senior engineers who were the ones who initially developed the products and who are the source of innovation for the company, right? So it puts a damper on how quickly they can continue to uh, devote attention to developing new products. Now they have to sit down and train the younger people that they are recruiting, okay? And therefore, that increases the amount of time that is needed by the company to develop new products and therefore, the rate at which new products start coming up reduces. Right. So this loop on the outside it doesn't, you know, it's not laid out properly fully. Right. So the balancing loop is really not this loop because this is not a loop. Right. You see that this arrow is in this direction. So there's really no loop here, although it looks circular. But the, the second loop is really this loop. New products, revenues, R&D budget, size of staff, management complexity, management burden to uh, senior engineers, product development time, new products. That's the balancing loop. Right. So uh, the, the limit to growth here is the capacity for managing large teams. That becomes your limit to growth. So both of these. Uh, so in this example, you have another example of uh, limits to growth. So you've got a young company that's growing. So obviously the employees, the initial employees have lots of promotion opportunities. Tremendous morale is developed among them. And then uh, they therefore have great motivation to work hard. And they're highly productive, which even spurs more growth. So that is your positive feedback loop here of uh, growth leading to increased morale, leading to even more growth. But the balancing factor is, of course, you can't keep growing forever because your market has a finite size. So your market niche is completely saturated. You find it more and more difficult to grow the niche. Everybody who wants your product already has it and that puts a damper on your growth. Okay, so saturation of the market niche puts a damper on your growth. You can't grow much further. And of course, then that starts affecting the reinforcing loop in the opposite direction. Because you're not able to grow. There are not promotion opportunities, reduction of morale, reduction of productivity, damper on growth. Okay, of course, we understand that uh, when you have a reinforcing feedback loop and it's working in the direction we want, everything is great. But once a reinforcing feedback loop starts working in the opposite direction, it's a problem because it's it's also downhill. Okay, so the pattern in which you could look at the company's revenue would look like this. It's growing and then it saturates. But the employee morale initially is growing fantastically. It saturates and then it actually starts going down. Okay. Uh, so this is another example of how uh, your organization has commitment to just-in-time manufacturing. And just-in-time manufacturing really means that you've got all your suppliers produce, you know, supplying new products, your raw materials at exactly the time when you want it. That is just-in-time manufacturing. And of course, the more commitment you have, uh, the more you succeed in just-in-time manufacturing the greater production flexibility and cost that you achieve, which increases your commitment to just-in-time manufacturing, which is fine, except that the more you make the suppliers supply products 
just in time, the greater the risk that suppliers have to face, right? Because all you've done is transferred your costs in the form of risks to the supplier. Because if there's a fluctuation in your production schedules, then that risk now goes to the supplier. And then supplier starts demanding to be the sole supplier source for your company. Okay. And when that happens, of course, you are threatened because the supplier can jack up prices. You become more and more dependent on a single supplier. So your bargaining power with that supplier goes down. That becomes a threat to you. And that could reduce your commitment to just-in-time manufacturing. Okay. So the uh, limit to growth here is the extent to which you can transfer your risk to the supplier. That's the limit to growth. Okay. So all of this you can you can transform uh, or you can summarize in the form of a generic archetype. Whatever we saw earlier, there were specific examples of limits to growth. Here we're saying the generic architecture is basically you've got a condition. The condition has a positive feedback loop in which the condition leads to uh, increasing its own uh, level, which is the positive side of it, right? More customers leading to greater growth. Right, commitment to just in time, increasing commitment to just in time, and so on. That is the place where you have the growth part of the cycle. But then there's the slowing action, which is the balancing part of the cycle. Right. So limits to growth is uh, consists of the archetype consists of two loops: one positive feedback loop or reinforcing loop, which is tempered by a balancing loop because there's a limit. Uh, you know, limiting factors come into play. Okay. So the slowing action is brought into place because there's a limiting condition. Why? You have finite number of customers for your product. So the once, once you start hitting up against that, you can't grow anymore. Uh, or you've got, there's only so much risk that you can transfer to your suppliers. Once you start going beyond that, then the suppliers start demanding more of the action. And that puts your uh, you know commitment to just-in-time production down. That reduces your commitment. Okay. So this is the generic archetype. And uh, when you're facing a limits to growth archetype, obviously the management philosophy or principle there has to be don't push growth. Your management approach has to be we are growing, that's great. Don't keep on pushing growth. Instead, focus your attention on limiting the factor, removing the factors which are limiting, which could potentially limit your growth. Right. So the management guideline here would be when you're facing a situation where there is a positive feedback loop taking you on a growth curve, it's great, it's fantastic, but you'll make a grave mistake if you don't address the factors that are limiting your growth. And this is a common mistake that people make. They really don't pay too much attention to factors that limit the growth. And every time they encounter one of these factors, uh, it acts, uh, you know, they act surprised. It looks more like an afterthought. Oh, I didn't think that's going to happen. I didn't think that's going to happen. Well, when you're having a positive feedback loop, you have to know that there are going to be balancing factors. A prudent management would be to say, well, let me find those. And let me manage those along with the process of managing my growth. Take a look at this causal loop diagram. So let's say you've got a company in which there's a personnel performance problem, right? That is, people are not motivated enough. They're not, they're not being productive enough, and for whatever whatever reason, there's a problem. Right? Now, one thing you might do is to bring in an HR expert who can talk to people, identify what is the problem uh, that they're facing and fix the problem okay so that's one approach to solving the problem which is to seek external help and solve the problem okay um, but of course we know that the fundamental solution to these kinds of problems is to develop the organization's internal ability to solve these problems right so when we have personnel problems our own managers are capable of dealing with this if they're not we develop their abilities to deal with these kinds of problems okay but uh, so 
on the top side is it shows the quick fix to a problem and on the bottom side we see the fundamental solution to the problem now very often what happens in organizations and in fact even in our personal life when we face a problem we are tempted to take the short route to take the quick fix and solve the problem in the short run but of course uh, the fundamental solution might be more difficult more time consuming and so on which is not uh, to our taste right so what really happens then is if you keep on applying the quick fix then you're degrading the organization's own ability to apply the fundamental solution right because in this example if you keep on hiring the external hr expert to solve your problem then within the organization itself you develop an expectation that we'll always rely on ex external hr experts to come and solve the problem and we'll not be able to develop our own managers abilities we'll have less and less faith in the fundamental solution less and less faith in our own ability to apply the fundamental solution this is also a common archetype lots of other examples of course that we are familiar with which is uh, let's say somebody has a problem with uh, credit card debt but they they have to pay too much of credit card interest they're not able to pay it what they could do of course is uh, to you know curtail their spending habits look at that their spending habits uh, you know and find the fundamental solution to getting rid of their uh, credit card problems okay but the quick fix would be well in order to pay my interest let me borrow even more money okay the real fundamental solution might be to look at their spending patterns and so on and so forth and curtail their spending but if they don't want to do that they can always face the pro solve the problem for the short term by taking out even more uh, borrowings to just pay the credit card interest of course we know that what really happens when they keep on doing that is their uh, you know credit card loan balances and so on keep on piling up even more okay or uh, to take an example uh, from a university scenario right let's say you've got a student you have you're a student you want to improve your grades but you're finding that your performance in the last couple of exams in a course have really been poor you've been receiving poor grades then the fundamental solution of course is to hunker down work hard uh, catch up speak to the instructor see the instructor during office hours understand everything you know to do all the hard work to solve the problem the quick fix might be simply to start cheating right you uh, cheat on assignments cheat on exams cheat on projects and so on and get by right but what really happens is if you keep on doing that you're getting further and further behind in the course sooner or later somebody is going to catch on to this problem and then you're really sunk okay and you lose faith in your own ability to uh, to study hard work hard and uh, understand what's going on so this is a common archetype and this archetype is called shifting the burden okay it's called shift the burden which means uh, so you can look at the generic archetype here you've got a problem symptom and one is for you to take the symptomatic solution which is the quick fix the other is the fundamental solution right and the more symptomatic more you keep relying on symptomatic solution the side effect is that you it weakens your resolve your ability your capability to apply the fundamental solution another example might be uh, let's say you're constantly getting colds and coughs and headaches and so on and so forth the fundamental solution would be for you to change your lifestyle become healthier work out uh, you know eat properly do all of these things but the symptomatic solution is to keep on taking uh, you know over the counter drugs and just keep uh, pushing the problem uh, further and further but when you keep doing that of course you become unhealthy and it becomes more and more difficult for you to do the fundamental thing which is eat right and be healthy and exercise and all of those things okay that's another example of shifting the burden right so what you're really doing is you're shifting the burden which is the burden being the hard work to apply the fundamental solution you're shifting that to the symptomatic 
solution, the quick fix. Another relevant example here might even be uh, our, uh, our own uh, petroleum problems in the US, for example. So here we know that importing foreign oil is a big problem for this country. In fact, burning fossil fuels is a foreign problem, whether it's imported or not imported. We know that it's a big problem, right? But uh, we're still not able to do anything about it, right? And of course, currently what I'm talking about is our dependence on foreign oil. That is a big problem. But how do you handle the problem? The fundamental solution, of course, is to reduce the amount of oil consumption itself, which is uh, to first identify uh, renewable sources of energy, uh, identify sustainable energy pat consumption patterns and all of those things. Those, that's the hard work which we need to do. But of course, our political economic system doesn't allow us to put in the effort to do the hard work. Because politically, going that route takes a long time. It's not politically attractive to anybody. So all politicians and all companies and all decision makers are forced to look for the short term solution, which is let's go find the next place where we can find oil or natural gas and start drilling. Okay, so we'll find oil in Alaska, let's go drill it. We find uh, deep sea oil, let's go drill it and so on. And of course, there are co uh, complex consequences of doing those things. But we keep doing that because that is the quick fix. Fundamental solutions are not attractive. Uh, you know, companies are looking for short term solutions, fundamental solution, short term results. Fundamental solutions take a long time, so it's not attractive. And therefore, we are on this uh, treadmill of always looking for symptomatic quick solutions. Okay, so this is called shifting the burden, shifting the burden from the hard work to the quick fix. Another important example is what happened in the US. Uh, uh, we all remember the dot-com bust of the late 90s, right? So the economy was booming, the dot, uh, internet had cost a lot of dot-com companies, a lot of investment, and you know, firms uh, were throwing a lot of money, investors were throwing a lot of money at any dot-com company idea that was being uh, floated. But of course, this sector was highly over-invested and everything came down crashing in late 1990, early 2000, right? Now, from a management point of view of the economy, the Federal Reserve decided in order to solve the problem, they decided that they'll handle the problem by keeping interest rates extremely low and keeping the economy uh, from uh, really facing the, the heat of that uh, dot-com bust, right? So they kept interest rates artificially low, which was the quick fix for them at that point, right? They didn't take the fundamental solution to say, okay, if you've lost a market, lot of market value, it's fine. Let's return to proper economics and proper business. They didn't do that. They kept interest rates artificially low. And what really happened as a result of that was that uh, we ended up inflating this whole real estate bubble. And that, of course, has burst to create a much worse situation for us today. So that's the side effect and highly undesirable side effect of shifting the burden. U.S. auto companies, you know, as they kept on facing competition from Japanese companies, uh, which were coming in with the higher quality vehicles, the U.S. automakers never really said our fundamental solution is to improve our quality. Instead, they tried to rely on all other kinds of techniques to keep afloat, which is essentially uh, hectic marketing, heavy amount of marketing, and providing all kinds of cheap finance to attract people to buy their cars. Okay. They kept on doing this, and of course, that has led them to be uh, to a really bad economic position. And today, of course, they are struggling to uh, to regain their old position. So these are all examples of the shifting the burden uh, archetype. Okay, so it's obvious. The management principle is obvious. Strengthen the fundamental response, weaken the symptomatic response. It might be necessary, the symptomatic response might be necessary to handle the problem in the short run. So it's not to say that you never should take the symptomatic response. You may have to in the short run, but be aware that even though by applying the symptomatic response, you're getting some respite 
in the short run don't get addicted to that cycle instead be aware that you have to still solve the big problem of strengthening the fundamental response another way also to look at this from a managerial perspective is well as a manager what can tell me that the organization is only doing the symptomatic response and not doing the fundamental response i think one of the important things here is to have metrics in place which are not just completely reliant on short run measures short term measures you must have metrics in place that talk about the long term health of the organization right so if your organization is constantly not applying the fundamental solutions then there should be some metrics that tell you that what you're doing is not good for the organization's long run okay so you need to have a good mix of metrics which are short term oriented but are also long term oriented and once you have that you know that you're weak in fundamental uh, responses and fundamental strengths of the organization and therefore you'll have some motivation to build those up